You are listening to WPHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio. This is Ghost Talk with 187 PI. Sit back and prepare yourselves for an adventure into the paranormal world with host Shelly Robertson and 187 PI Research Team. Ghost Talk is broadcasting live from Ohio's most haunted jail. Learn about their ongoing research at the jail and abroad, investigation techniques, and their personal encounters. Here is your host of Ghost Talk and 187 PI founder, Shelly Robertson. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Ghost Talk Radio. With me is your host, Shelly Robertson. We have a fantastic show planned for you tonight, and we're bringing it to you live from the haunted Old Paulding County Jail here in Paulding, Ohio. I invite all, all of my listening friends out there to join us in chat at WBHM-DB.com where you can get in on tonight's topic of conversation. Tonight I have Kristen Boyd here with me to discuss witches, legends, and their lore, trials, and hauntings. Hello and welcome Kristen. Hey guys. I want to take this first opportunity this moment. We have a very dear friend and someone who always listens to all the shows. Her name is Brenda, and today is her birthday. Happy birthday, Brenda. Happy birthday. So, you know me. I love to dive into the history of things, so this is going to be no different. One of the earliest records of a witch, okay, folks, It was actually written in the Bible between 931 B.C. and 721 B.C. Now, the witch craze itself, it didn't really take hold until about the 1400s within Europe. That's where it all starts. Seems like everything starts across the pond, doesn't it? It does. (laughs) You know... Between the years of 1482 and 1782, there were like 100,000 people who were accused of witchcraft in Europe. That's a lot of people. Huge amount of people. Upwards of 80,000 of these people, suspected witches, so they were, they were put to death. Imagine. 80% of them were women. And, you know, witchcraft, it actually became a crime within England in 1542 with the most popular choice of the guilty charge being death by hanging. (laughs) Believe it. Yes. Well, it all truly began because people were forced to live primitive lives without luxuries of the modern medicines and treatment that we have today. And at the time, when a person was sick, ill, or in pain, there was little that could actually be done to help them. It was also during this time that some sage women learned the value of healing through herbs and other types of homeopathic treatments. And, you know, they don't usually call them sage women in these days, do they? They do not. (laughs) Well, they became very educated with the knowledge of herbal remedies to help ailments and ease childbirths by using various plant-based medicines. Well, unfortunately, during that time, little was understood about healing in those days. And it was, as Christianity spread across Europe, of course, many of the clergy of the church, they were upset about the aspect of women being educated. Is that insane? It is sad. It is. And as far as the church was concerned, all healing 
should be done strictly through the men in the church. No, that's nothing for the women. And we were worried about, you know, the right to vote. Exactly. <laughs> you know, over time, these healers, they began to be associated and accused of various crimes, such as heresy, being anti-Christian even, and eventually many were even accused of devil worshiping. Uh, well, you know, back in those days, everything must be the devil, you know? Yep. Think about that. Now, the church viewed he healing as like an evil sorcery and of black magic, you know? These supposed witches, they were now being accused of doing the devil's work and being in cahoots with him and some of the most orchestrated plans to help destroy mankind. That's what they thought. In reality, they were helping people. That's right. <laughs> and they were believed to worship in large nocturnal groups where various social acts were performed, such as, you know, a little, not, you know, promiscuous, hanky-panky, <laughs> naked dancing. <laughs> yeah, and, so right, and gluttonous feasting get this, on human flesh of infants. Oh my. That is insane. Now, at the height of these acts, people at the time believed the devil himself would appear to participate with all the attendants. So he was, I guess, dancing naked around the campfire <laughs> too. <laughs> what a sight to see. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, to tame these evil women, the Pope, he issued a document on December 5th, 1484, that condemned the witches. He also um, authorized two inquisitors, and it was Jacob Springer and a Mr. Kramer to combat this problem of the witches. They produced this book that was entitled... The Hammer of Witches, okay, they even wrote a book, this is crazy, that both Catholics and Protestants accepted. Now, the book itself, it contains stories about witches based on folklore, providing guidelines on how to identify and eliminate the witches. This book had been described as the most vicious and the most damaging book to ever been written in the world of literature, okay, that is saying something. Yes, it is. This book served as the platform for witch hunters to act on their prejudice for over 200 years. Sad people could be yes, manipulated a for so long. Witch hunting book. Yeah. Now, these accusations and the new laws, they drove the healers further underground, of course. And uh, many of these healers, they tried to live quiet lives in deeply remote peasant villages. Unfortunately, by the late 1400s, that was not enough for these healers. They were eventually found and questioned about how they were practicing the craft. Now, religious sources were planning, planting fear, as well as hysteria, into the minds of many people by stating and accusing these healers of practicing witchcraft, which would be tried and executed publicly for all to see. So they made a big spectacle of it. Right. The actual accusations of witchcraft, you, you will not believe this, it required no actual evidence of guilt. That's the most astonishing thing, isn't it? Just by word of mouth. Yes. They could force all these people to believe these other people were witches. Yes, yes. Didn't well, need any proof. Yeah. Well, witches and the practice of witchcraft continue to be feared, and the legends and myths surrounding them continue to evolve. Now, due to the festival of Samhain, a celebration at the end of harvest season, a great deal of folklore was created. During Samhain, witches were thought to anoint themselves with a balm that made their faces very shiny and light. It is thought that this ointment gave their skin an ethereal appearance, leading up to the rumors of witches being able to fly. 
Oh, so that's where that comes from. It came from a little far-fetched, but you know. Yeah. So early so-called witches did carry brooms, but not for flying, as <laughs> some would think. Now, these brooms were actually used to cleanse an area or room before a healing ritual could be performed. Now, these days, I think they use feathers and yeah. such to do mm -hmm. such things. Well, this practice could have led to the notion that witches could fly and did so with the aid of a broomstick. Far-fetched? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But obviously not for past times. Right. Well, eventually, thousands were arrested and brought to the inquisitors for examination. Now, one way the accused witch was tested was by stripping and shaving them. Oh. I can't imagine. Then they were searched, usually in public, for any suspicious markings they called the devil's mark. Now, they would then stick a needle into any spot they found, such as birthmarks, warts, holes, and scars. If the prick didn't hurt or bleed, the spot was considered a mark of Satan. No kidding. Mm -hmm. Well, some accused were bound and put into a blessed body of water. If they sank, they were deemed innocent and pulled out. Now, if they floated, they were considered witches and executed on the spot and handed over to be tried. Other suspects were weighed because it was thought that witches had little to no weight. Oh, my gosh. I am a chubby girl, so <laughs> I would float. <laughs> And I would be hanged. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Craziness. Well, in most cases, to be able to execute the accused, they first needed to confess to being a witch. So other torturing measures were set in place to help them with the confessions. Kind of probably much like the detectives of today, how they interrogate and badger until you break, you know? I can see that. The church would use instruments. Oh, for tree, <laughs> such as thumb and leg screws, oh, ouch, yeah. head clamps, and the iron maiden to generate the truth needed to complete the execution. Well, it was warned, though, that when the woman or women were under examination and torture, the torturer was not to make on eye contact with them as her evil powers might cause the torture to develop feelings of compassion. That is the most insane thing I've ever heard. So <laughs> while you're, you know, screwing my leg to the floor or whatever, oh my goodness. do not look into the eyes or oh you will feel sorry for me. My, and who wouldn't confess? Even if Just to get them to stop. Exactly. That's, you know. That's crazy. Well, finally, relief of accused witchcraft and witches began to arrive. <coughs> In 1631, a priest named Frederick Spee, who had accompanied many people judged to be witches, stated that none, in his viewpoint, were actually guilty. Well, oh, bravo! Bravo! <laughs> and if that witch hunting continued, the land would become empty of people. <laughs> Obviously. Especially since it was targeting women. So. Yes. Meanwhile, physicians began recognizing that such things as seizures could be linked to health related issues and not demon possessions. It was during the 17th century that the number of trials sharply decreased, and by the end of that century, the witch craze had all but ended. Oh boy. Unfortunately, the witch craze of Europe did not go unnoticed. As the craze was declining in Europe, it began taking place within the U.S. Oh, boy. So it's leaving there and it's coming here. The legends, lores, trials, and torture techniques varied from some of the Europe's, you know, overall perspectives. Within the U.S., the belief of witches or wizards were that they were bound to Satan by giving them their soul, and in return... They received the gift of having supernatural powers. Think about that. Interesting. Indeed. Yes. The deed was signed in blood of the witch, and horrible ceremonies confirmed the pact. Satan would then give his now ally a familiar in the form of a dog, cat, ape, or other small black animal. Okay? 
People believe that these witches were capable to raise storms, blight crops, cause abortions, lame cattle, topple over houses, cause pains, convulsions, and various other illnesses. They also believe that they too had power to ride the winds, usually with a broomstick. So they believe that here in the U.S. too. But it was only after she had smeared her broom with that magic ointment. I want some of that ointment. Yeah. (laughs) We've got some brooms in there. Let's go take a ride. (laughs) Well, there is a legend that states that if the witch desired to harm a person, that she would make a clay or wax image of them and use that image to wreak havoc on them by taking a knife, needle, fire, or water to it. That is almost like voodoo. Exactly. That's what I would say. Whatever was done to that image, the person was to feel that pain physically themselves, no matter how far away that person may be. A few examples would be that if the image was placed in running water, hot sunshine, or near fire, the living flesh would waste away as it melted or dissolved, and the person was this was wrought upon would die. Well, they could do it to me for a little bit, so some of this... <laughs> fat melt it off me and I wouldn't have to worry about a diet. That'd be fabulous. (laughs) The first person to actually be convicted of witchcraft in the U.S. was a woman by the name of Alice Young. History states that she was hung on May 26, 1647 for witchcraft, but there were no records of any trial or any accusation. However, there is a wide variety of speculations of why she was accused, raising, uh, raging from her um, being the age of 40 with no son, for an example. She didn't have a son, so they thought she might be a witch. Hmm. And there was um, this influenza epidemic in the area that had a high mortality rate. And they said that she could maybe be blamed for that. Um, or be blamed for possibly being a healer at that time, <clears throat> or that she could have just been making herbal remedies for fe- fellow uh, settlers, you know, later in life. Roughly 30 years in Springfield, Massachusetts, her daughter was also accused of witchcraft, but her daughter was not um, executed. That's good to know. And with that, folks, we will be right back after this short break. You're listening to Ghost Talk Radio on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown. All of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. Son of a... Hey, son. Mother... Uh, son, what are you doing? Hey, Mom. I'm getting ready to listen to Periscope Uncensored. By expanding your vocabulary. Well, it is uncensored. Son, the uncensored part of Periscope Uncensored is Jax and I getting down to brass tacks with all aspects of the paranormal. There's no fluff on our show. So, no off-color commentary? I didn't say that. Awesome! (laughs) Son? Uh, I just hit my head. Oh boy, I'll go get you an ice pack. Catch Periscope Uncensored Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, only on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... 
Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Ghost Talk Radio. With me is your host, Shelly Robertson. And joining me is Kristen Boyd. If you just tuned in, we invite you all to join us in chat at WBHM-DB.com where you can ask us any questions you might have. And if you missed the first part of the show, no worries, folks. You can catch the full show archive on Spreaker, Google Play, iTunes, and iHeartRadio at your leisure. Now, before the break, we were discussing some of the Salem Witch Trials, and we were just getting into how they come about over here in the U.S. So you know... Some of the legends of that, correct? Well, I do. Okay. Actually, 30 years before the infamous Salem Witch Trials took place, a witch hysteria took hold in Hartford, Connecticut in 1662, resulting in seven trials and four executions. It all began when a woman named Ann Cole suddenly became afflicted, shaking violently and spouting blasphemies. Cole blamed her outbursts and ailments on her neighbor, Rebecca Greensmith. It was then the accused began to accuse others, including their own spouses, of being the actual true witch. Oh, boy. (laughs) Your husband would accuse you. Oh, my goodness. Well, the testimony that created the most chaos came from Greensmith herself. Oh. Who reportedly admitting having familiarity with the devil. She even stated that her husband was a part of this and that they had met in the woods with seven other witches. Now, oh. why you would testify against yourself, I have no clue. Oh, boy. <laughs> but the neighbors also testified. they seen them dancing with other women in the woods <laughs> and that they were cooking concoctions in black kettles. So that's where those cauldrons yeah. came into play. Well, Greensmith confessed all this in court, but her husband protested his innocence. Unfortunately for him, they both met the same fate, hanging. Two others were also executed and met the same fate as the Greensmiths. After the executions, Cole reportedly was restored to health. No kidding. Imagine that. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what. Let's move on to some of the most known witch trials within the U.S. And that is, folks, you guessed it. The Salem Witch Trials, right? I mean, who doesn't know some, a little bit, at least, of something about yeah. that? Now, these trials, they began in the spring of 1692 after a group of young girls claimed to be possessed by the devil and accused several local women of witchcraft. Now, the first convicted witch was Bridget Bishop, and she was hanged that June. 18 others would follow her to the Salem's Gallows Hills, while an additional 150 more folks, men, women, and even children were accused. Kids. That's insane. It was in January of 1692 when nine-year-old Elizabeth Paris and 11-year-old Abigail Williams, they began having violent fits that included, um, you know, like contortions and outbursts of screaming, okay? Now, it was after a local doctor by the name of William Griggs who diagnosed bewitchment. He diagnosed them as being witches. Oh, my gosh. That additional, you know, then additional younger girls in the community, they began to exhibit similar um, symptoms. So now you have all these little kids. You know, which running around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they probably had some kind of real 
valid ailment. Right. Exactly. Now, these in girls, they included a, another little girl named um, Ann Putman, Mercy Lewis, Elizabeth Hubbard, Mary Wolcott, and Mary Warren. Okay. Now, Paris had a Caribbean slave named Tituba. And Tituba was arrested in late February, along with two other women, including a homeless beggar and an elderly woman. After the girls accused them of bewitching them. So they all these little girls did that, right? Well, they were brought uh, before the magistrate and they were all questioned. And all of them pleaded their innocence except for Tituba, who confessed, all right? She confessed to being a witch. Wow. More than likely seeking to save herself, you know, from death by acting as an informer and claiming there were additional witches acting alongside of her in service of the devil himself. So she thought that maybe... It would help her. Yeah, if she came clean or whatever, they would spare her. Well, unfortunately, <coughs> it was then that mass hysteria broke out among the communities and many others began to be accused of witchcraft as well. Wow. Including, including a four-year-old girl. That is just craziness. It is. Now, these accusations continued and eventually overwhelmed the local justice system. So in May of 1692, the new governor, William Phipps, ordered a special court hearing to make the final decisions on the accused witches and their cases. Well, you know, the court reached their first conviction on June 2nd against uh, Bridget Bishop, who was hanged eight days later, right? Five more were hanged that July five in August, and eight more in September. In addition to the hangings, seven others were, that were accused, they died in jail. So they, they didn't even get hanged. Right. So it was probably from the poor conditions in the jail. Starvation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now there was this man named Giles Corey. He, um, this is disgusting. <laughs> He was pressed to death by stones after he refused to enter a guilty plea. So they squashed him with big rocks. I have to take a while. Oh, really that would have been painful. disgusting. Well, in October, the governor dissolved the special court hearings and mandated that its successors disregard spectral evidence. About time. Yes. Unfortunately, the trials continued until early 1693, but by May, Phipps had pardoned and released all those in prison on witchcraft charges. In January of 1697, the Massachusetts General Court declared a day of fasting for the tragedy of the Salem witch trials, later deeming the trials unlawful. The families of the convicted so-called witches received restitution to the heirs in 1711. No matter, though, the events that took place during this time will never be forgotten within the history of the United States. Absolutely not. And, you know, people flock to those areas just to see it. Right. You know? Um, well, of course, we're, we're coming closer in history here. And I'm sure you all know that witches are still in existence today. And thankfully... They do not have to fear the death penalty to conduct the practice. Now, a general definition of the modern witch is someone who works with the forces of nature and the divine energy to make changes to their reality. All right? They are seekers of answers through the study of folklore, um, legend, mythology, religion, and, of course, history. There are considered to be five modern witches in existence today and include the eclectic, traditional, green, hedge, and kitchen witches. And there are actually a few others, but we'll save those for another show. We're going to do these main ones here tonight. Now, these witches can follow a more traditional path 
set up by their ancestors, or they can make their own path or their own practices that is specifically shaped to fit their own personal religions, lifestyles, beliefs, customs. So it's kind of like anything goes, you know, right. really? Mm -hmm. The eclectic witch is one who takes from many different religions, traditions, and magical practices to create their own personal craft. They may also use different forms of divination um, from a different from a variety of different cultures and they may choose to leave religion out of their practice completely um, they can also decide just to practice the magic aspect of witchcraft without even having any set belief standards you know well being a traditional witch means that they either are a traditional Wiccan or a traditional folkloric witch. A Wiccan differs from folkloric in the sense that they base their practice off their Wiccan religion. Now, folkloric witchcraft is considered a magical practice based on historical and folkloric accounts of witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Antidote folk magic, folklore folk medicine, and ancient myths are used daily in a folkloric witch's, witch's practice. Yeah, and that's what you hear a lot today. People claim to be Wiccan. Right. You know, and I think that's probably the most popular one that I hear people talking about, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Now, green witches, they're also known as garden witches. They tend to spend most of their witchcraft in the garden or with greenery. They will speak with the plants, connect with the spirits of the plants, and travel into the woods and forests in order to attain certain plant, you know, or some knowledge about the plant. from the spirit realm and to explore their otherworldly abilities and deeper, more meaningful levels. Mm -hmm. Now, hex crossing, more well known as astral projection, lucid dreaming, or shaman trance work, is a huge part of a hex witch's practice. By going into a conscious dream state, well, they can then meet with their ancestors and other beings. Now, the actual term hedge crossing was used by shamans and white people in the medieval times in Europe. Ah, well, astral projection witch. Hmm, that's interesting. It is. Lastly, folks, is the kitchen witch or the home and hearth witch. They make most of their magic in their kitchen or by the hearth side. These witches love to cook. They work with herbs. They make teas. And they make brews from the comforts of their own home. They use the herbs with medicinal and magical intention within their cooking. So I suppose they would be making spells with some of this stuff. I would say. They also pray or chant over the food while they are cooking or serving. And they also study older recipes of their ancestors. And next, we will be discussing the hauntings surrounding these lore legends of the witches. And first, we are going to start off with one of the most well-known haunting. I mean, it should be the most well-known haunting. Yes, I've heard about it since I was little. It's it's the most well known one to ever be recorded in history about a witch. 
so well known in fact that movies have been made relating to the Bell family's experiences. There's been books, there's been people study this and, and deemed to be experts on the Bell Witch, and the haunting is simply known as the Bell Witch. The legend begins by saying a very um, uh, a sinister entity. It began tormenting a family in Tennessee's early frontier between the years of 1817 and 1821. This haunting even had um, eyewitnesses accounts recorded and manuscripts were penned by those who experienced the wrath of the Bell Witch firsthand. So, Kristen, tell us about some of the story of the Bell Witch. Okay. It all started in the early 1800s when John Bell moved his family to the Red River bottomland in Tennessee, where he purchased some land and a farmhouse for his family. Once moved, Bell continued to grow, having three more children and adding an astounding 328 acres to his farm. That's a lot of land. Big chunk. Well, in 1817, while John was out inspecting his land, he encountered a strange-looking animal. Shocked by the look of it, which had the body of a dog and a head of a rabbit. <laughs> bizarre. Very bizarre. He shot at it several times, which I do not blame him. All right. Well, the animal vanished after the shots, and John headed back home for dinner without a second thought of his weird encounter. That is, until he and his family began hearing beating sounds on the outside of the walls of their log home later that evening. Oh. These strange sounds continued with increased frequency and force, and force each night. Bell and his sons would often rush out to see if they could discover what was causing the commotion, but to no avail. In the weeks that followed the dreaded day, the Bell children began waking at night frightened and complaining that rats were gnawing at their bedposts. Oh my. Well, it wasn't too long after that, they also began complaining of having their covers pulled off of them and their pillows were being tossed up to the floor by an invisible entity. Oh my. So you can imagine, folks, as time went on and they all began to hear more faint whispering voices, but they, the voices were actually too weak for them to understand what was being said, but it was described as sounding like an old feeble woman singing hymns. Now, these encounters continued to escalate, and the Bell's youngest daughter, Betsy, she began experiencing brutal encounters with this entity. She would cry that it was pulling her hair, and she would be seen um, being slapped relentlessly, but they couldn't see what was doing it, but, but it looked like she was being slapped. And this often left welts and handprints all over her body. Now, these disturbances, which John has told his family to keep a secret, they didn't want anybody to know, it escalated so greatly that he himself decided to share his family troubles with his closest friend and neighbor, Jane Johnston, okay? Now, Johnston and his wife, they decided to stay the night with the Bell family in their home where they received the same terrifying disturbances as the Bells had. After having his bed covers removed and being slapped repeatedly, Johnson sprang from his bed yelling, in the name of the Lord, why are you here and what do you want? <laughs> you know, to which she received no response, but the remainder of the night was silent after that. Now, could you imagine? That would be scary. Would be scary. Yes. And with that, folks, we will be back after this short message. You are listening to Ghost Talk Radio on WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama.
Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Ghost Talk Radio with me as your host, Shelly Robertson. And joining me tonight is Kristen Boyd. If you just tuned in, I invite you all to join us in chat at WBHM-DB.com where you can ask us any questions you may have or share any haunting witch stories of your own. So if you missed the first part of the show, no worries, folks. You can catch that full show archive on Spreaker, Google Play, iTunes, and iHeartRadio. Okay, so before the break, we were digging into the Bell Witch story. One of my favorites. The hauntings. And we got to where... The Johnstons just, you know, sprang from the bedroom in the middle of the night. So take us a little further into that haunting, Kristen. I can do that. So over time, the entity's voice strengthened to the point it was loud and unmistakable. No, they could actually hear them them this time. So it did, did sing hymns, but it also quoted scripture and even carried on intelligent conversations with the family. Wow. Now, word of the supernatural phenomenon soon spread outside of the settlement, even going as far as Nashville, where then Major General Andrew Jackson took a keen interest in Oh, now that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Spectacular. John Bell, John Bell Jr., Drury, and Jesse Bell had all fought under General Jackson in the Battle of New Orleans. In 1819, Jackson decided to visit the Bell family to see exactly what all the commotion was about. As I'm sure he would be wondering. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, Jackson brought with him several men, horses, and a wagon. As his entourage approached the Bell farm, the wagon stopped suddenly. The horses could no longer pull it. Now, after several minutes of trying to coax the horses, Jackson proclaimed, By the ethereal boys." That must be the Bell Witch. Well, then they heard a disembodied female voice that told Jackson and his men that they could proceed and that she would see them again later that evening. After that, they were able to proceed onto the Bell Farm with no trouble. Okay, so now they go in and we several hours go by with no disturbances. You know, when one of Jackson's men pulled out a shiny pistol and proclaimed that its silver bullets would kill any evil spirit, going on to say that the reason that nothing had happened to them was because whatever had been disturbing the bells was scared of the silver bullets. Now, immediately, the man began to scream and jerk his body in all kinds of different directions, proclaiming that he was being stuck with pins and beaten severely. So... So that's where the the little doll item comes in, right? There you go. (laughs) Right? Like the voodoo pin cushion. Yep, exactly. Now, eventually, this sent that man running out the door, angry. The entity spoke up proclaiming that there was yet another fraud in the Jackson party, and that he would be identified and tormented the following evening. So evidently, the guy that was getting stuck with pins... He was a fraud. Now, needless to say, Jackson's men were now terrified, and they begged to leave the Bell Farm. But Jackson insisted on, st- you know, staying to see who exactly the other fraud was in his, you know, group of guys. You know, I'm certainly you'd want to know. Absolutely. Eventually, the men went outside to sleep within their tents, and. At this point, it was not clear what actually happened next, but Jackson and his men were spotted in nearby Springfield early the next morning en route to back to Nashville. So they hightailed it out of there, and it doesn't end there, though, does it, Kristen? It doesn't. Unfortunately for the Bells, the hauntings and torment only continue. Now, by 1820, John had been experiencing episodes of twitching in his face and difficulty swallowing. Oh, that's a little nerving if you can't swallow. Yes, that'd be horrible. Yeah. 
and by that fall, his declining health had confined him to the house where the entity commenced removing his shoes when he tried to walk and slapping his face when he experienced seizures. Kind of Ooh. Ooh. Well, John Bell passed on December 20th, 1820. Immediately following his death, the family found a small vial of un unidentified liquid in the cupboard. Now, Junior gave some of, it to the, some of it to the cat, which died instantly. Oh, poor kitty. That's kind of what I thought. You know, it was then that the entity spoke up in a joyful, joyful manner, stating, I, I gave old John a big dose of that last night, which fixed him. Oh, it fixed him all right, right? It sure did. And Junior quickly threw the vial into the fireplace, where it burst into a bluish flame and shot up the chimney. Now, after that, the entity's presence was almost non-existent, as if its purpose had been fulfilled. Very interesting. Like it just wanted to kill John. John. Torture him his whole entire life until he passed. Yes. Well, I'll tell you. It, it, it keeps on going. Okay. By now, it's April, 1821 when the entity visited John's widow and it told her it would return in seven years for a visit and it did. In 1828, as promised, it returned but most of its visits were centered on John Jr. The entity said farewell after three weeks, okay? Promising to visit the John Bell's most um, direct descendants in 107 years. This descendant would have been Dr. Charles Barley Bell in 1935. There have been no encounters though were ever documented of this. So the cause of the Bell's torment that still remains a mystery to this day. However, most do agree that there was something very wrong at the Red River settlement in the early 1800s, and there may still be something not quite right there yet today. A lot of strange phenomena has been reported on the land. There's been books written about the curse of the Bell Witch, and there actually are still living descendants to this very day. Now, if I was them, I'd be just a little bit nervous. Wouldn't you, though, if you knew you were Descend it and things happened to yes. a lot of them. And sure. The entity threatened to come back at some point. Now there is another haunting relating to witches, and that would include Elysium, which is also known as Turner Seafood, which so happens to be located in Salem, Massachusetts as well. Now this building is thought to be one of the most haunted places within Salem. The property is reported to be haunted by a lady in a long white period style dress, and she's most often seen on the staircase. So here we go again, everyone, with the hauntings and legends, the famous lady in white. Lady in white, always there. Yep. Now, since this building sits on the land that was once an orchard owned by Bridget Bishop, now remember who Bridget Bishop was? one of the first women to be accused and executed for witchcraft. Many believe that this is Bridget who is seen as the Lady in White. Other reports within this building include seeing additional apparitions, light anomalies, and the building having many, many electrical malfunctions. Well, the last witch haunting we will be discussing today is located in what is now a ghost town. A ghost town. Those are awesome. You should visit. Yes. So that's in Pierre Cheney, Michigan. Pierre Cheney was a small village of about 1,500 people in the 1870s. Oh. And by 1901, diphtheria had wiped out all but 25. Oh my gosh, it wiped out so many people back then. Oh my goodness. And by 1917, it became a ghost town. All that remains today is the cemetery, who some say is haunted by a witch that was blamed for the disease and fire outbreaks. Wow. The legend states that
that a witch cursed the village and caused the disease and the fires that spread throughout this small community. The village banished her to live within the woods on the outskirts of the village. Later, after the deaths of so many villagers occurred from the disease that spread throughout the community, she was hanged from a tree within the cemetery and buried. There are roughly 90 plots that reside there. Now, visitors have captured what appears to be an angry woman's face within the pictures of who they believe to be the accused witch. They've also reported hearing voices, seeing figures, and even glowing orbs. Now, I would like to go there and just snap dozens and dozens of pictures to see. to see if I could get that face in my shawl. Yep, I would too. Okay, folks, now I want to look, talk a little bit about what's going on here at the old Paulding County Jail in Paulding, Ohio. Of course, we do have the escape games running this month, and ending up this month is the Big Top Circus. This is probably our most fun theme. Now, during this escape game, players have 60 minutes to escape before they meet their demise. I will tell you, folks, these games are so much fun, and they also help with the restoration efforts of the old Paulding County Jail. So if you would like to learn more about the escape games or schedule an escape game session, uh, just go to jailbreakcode9.com, and that's the number nine. At the website, you can read about all the themes, schedule game sessions, and even email the jailer if you have any further questions. And the jailer likes to email people back, and he's quite comical. <laughs> we also have a full schedule of events for this spring, summer, and fall that are happening here at the Old Baldwin County Jail. And you can see the schedule at our website at 187pi.com. We have many dates for private paranormal investigations as well as the information you need to schedule a private investigation for you and your paranormal team. I will also mention that all available dates for 2019 have been posted for the private investigations and no other dates will be added to the list. So if you don't want to miss your opportunity, get your date picked and book it today. Just go to 187pi.com. That's where you find all the information on that. <coughs> Pardon me. We are also having some special events here at the jail this year, which I want to remind you all. It's the most haunted jail in the state of Ohio, and stuff happens here every single day. And we like to call these special events the birthday party events. And what they are is exactly what it sounds like. We are having birthday party, paranormal investigations, for all the resident spirits this year who contacts us every day, you know, or, or quite frequently, the ones that we know when their birthday is, we are having a birthday party event for them. We did one last year for Gary Murray, who contacts us every anniversary of his death, which is also the anniversary of his birthday. And we found, we got some fantastic evidence. It was so... It was so nice, and it seemed like he was happy. It we, it was such a great turnout. It, it, was it really nice was. Experience. It was. And so that's what made us decide to go ahead and give all of our resident spirits a birthday party. Now, if you want to attend one of these, not only is it a birthday party, it's, it's also for research purposes too, folks. Tickets can be found on our Facebook page. Just type in 187PI Facebook search, the little search engine at the top, and we'll pop right up. Or you can find them at 187PI.com under events. I um, want to let everybody know also, we are going to be at the Ohio State Reformatory Paracon. That is happening May 4th and 5th. We'll have a booth there. And the CEO, Kat Hobson, of our network, WBHMDB, will be there with us. So you'll want to stop by our booth and say hello. <laughs> Show some support if you're up this way. Coming up May 11th, this is very exciting. Yes, it is. I am so thrilled 
to be able to do this. We're at a point where we need you, friends, okay? Coming up, May 11th, we are having interview sessions. We are looking for a few people who would like to be a part of the 187 PI research team. For more information and to register for an interview, go to Facebook, type in the search feature, 187 PI will pop up. Or you can also find the info at our website, 187pi.com under events. You must register to attend the interview session. We have several spots available. You don't have to have any experience, but experience is helpful. So weekends free, um, reliable transportation. Hey, come. Yep. A desire to learn more about the paranormal field. We need you. Now, here's what we have coming up on our wonderful network, WBHM-DV, Sunday nights at 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern. We have Fate Magazine Radio with host Kat Hobson. Monday night at 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern, we have Paranormal Pride Show with host Denise Pridemore. Wednesday nights, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern, we have Paranormal Experience with host Kat Hobson. Thursday nights from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern, we have Periscope Uncensored with host Laura Brownlow. Let me tell you, they're fantastic shows with great information and amazing guests. You will want to be sure to tune in, and I will tell you folks as we come to the